So we're going to go backwards into the new, uh, the Old Testament uh, today, and uh, I don't know. This, this kind of had been on my heart and mind. Jonah kept talking about Jonah, and uh, and you know, with Easter coming up, uh, maybe that's why. But uh, I thought it, you know, I don't know how long it will take. It's hard for me to guess, uh, gauge kind of when I put a lesson together how long it's going to last. I mean, generally speaking. We get through about tw uh, 10 to 12 questions on a handout, but it depends on how long-winded we are. So I don't know if we'll get out early or late today, to be honest with you. But we're going to try to get through the first uh, chapter of Jonah. And uh, Jonah's an interesting book. Jonah, uh, it, it suffers the same fate as uh, uh, the account of uh, Noah and the ark. Because what Christians have done... Uh, pretty much based on our uh, moronic uh, Christian scholars of the last uh, 200 years that started allegorizing scripture and not taking God at his word and tried to make everything fairy tale. And see, see, that's a satanic plot. We've talked about this in Genesis. Uh, you go and you buy your kids uh, books about Noah and it's got this little old boat with a giraffe with his head sticking out of the window. Well, what is that? That's a fairy tale. So we have generations of Christians that are teaching our children just based on what they're giving them to read. This stuff's not real. It's no different than, you know, Mickey Mouse or whatever. Uh, but no, it is real. It is real. And, uh, and so uh, a lot of folks, they read the account of Jonah, and they think, well, that's just a story in the Bible to make a point. It is a story in the Bible to make a point. But here's how God works. Uh, he works through historical events. Now, there's no doubt that God will uh, use a parable. That's Jesus uses parables. But what, here, here's, where, here's how you know if you're looking at a parable or not, just for your information. A parable never names the people in it. If you're reading an account in the Bible and there are names associated with the characters involved in the account, it's true in literal, literal history. We see this in uh, Luke chapter 16 whenever Jesus is talking about the rich man in hell. And people will say, well, that's a parable. That isn't a parable. That really happened. That feller's burning right now. Right now, as we speak, he's burnt. And uh, he had he, he didn't name the rich man, but he named Lazarus, and he named Abraham, and he talked about their conversations. And so, uh, anyway, that's why. So this this is a literal uh, uh, account that actually happened. And the question, first question is why study Jonah? Why this little insignificant, uh, you know? two-page book in the Bible, why should we study? Well, there's a very, very good reason. It's found in Matthew 12, 38. Somebody read that. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered, saying, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. But he answered and said to them, An even, evil <clears throat> and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish. So will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So this is a huge sign in the Old Testament about what Messiah is going to do. So this book of Jonah is in the Old Testament, and it is, and it is, uh, it is a, it is one of those instances where you do not know. The, uh, think about these Hebrew scholars. Uh, the scribes, the Pharisees, and all that. They had no what to, they didn't know what to do with the book of Jonah. Just think about it. I mean, you know, so it's just a guy, he's running off, and the Lord, you know, uh, brings him back to do something. Uh, and there's practical applications of Jonah, but they had no idea what the main purpose of the book was. It's the same way, the same thing happened with the brazen serpent. You remember whenever the children of Israel were in the wilderness and the snakes were biting them and killing them? And the Lord told Moses, make a brazen bronze serpent. Put it on a pole. An idol of all things. An idol. 
and they raised that thing up, people would look at them after they got bit by them snakes and would die. You had no idea what that had anything to do with until Jesus told them when he was on this planet. As Moses lifted up the serpent, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And so this is clues that God giving in the Old Testament about what his real plan is. That's why we need to take a close look at Jonah. And we don't just need to <clears throat> skip over it like a, it's a nice little story. Uh, because there's a whole lot more to it than a, than a guy running away from the Lord. Now that's a part of it. We're going to talk about that. There's applications that we can make in our lives as Christians today. Practical applications out of this book. We don't want to miss the main point. And the main point is it is pointing to the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Alright. I'm going to let somebody read verse 1 right here. This print's pretty small. This Bible for me. Somebody read Jonah verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah and the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it. All right, so uh, he, he says in here, he, he, just, he says who Jonah is. And, and, this is why we, and this is why it's important that you study the Scripture, because we're going to find out those scribes and Pharisees and priests that were hammering on Jesus didn't do a very good job of studying the Scripture. And so let's look at who, who Jonah was and where he came from. And so somebody read uh, Joshua 19.10. I heard a lot <clears throat> came out of the children of Zebulun according to their families, and the border of their inheritance was as far as Syria. Their border went towards the west to uh, Marilah, went to Nebuchadnezzar, and extended along the brook that is east of Jesus. Zokin, then from Syria, then went eastward toward the sunrise along the border of Chislop Tabor, and went out toward Dabareth by passing Jephthah. And from there it passed along the east of Geth Heifer towards Eth Zenon and extended to Ramon, which borders on Nia. <coughs> Yeah, good job. <laughs> so this is very important here. A little geography here. That's this terrible rendering of Israel. But right here you got the Sea of, sea of Galilee. It's in the northern part of Israel. And then it says <coughs> Zebulun. You know, uh, God divided up Israel uh, uh, amongst the tribes, the, ch uh, the children of Israel. Well, Zebulun's right here. Right there next to the Sea of Galilee. And it's going to be important in a minute. And... Uh, and here's how we know uh, where Jonah was from. Uh, I've got underlined there in that passage, uh, Gath Heifer. And so we know that Gath Heifer, according to Joshua 19, is in Zebulun, right? And so now somebody read 2 Kings 14, 23. We're going to find out uh, about this guy, uh, Jonah. In the 15th year of Amaziah, king of So here we have it all tied together, okay? And, but look where y'all, how you got to go. You got to get in that Bible and get all around it, figure it all out. Okay, so we we knew based on Joshua that God Hef, Gath Heifer was in Zebulun. And we know that Zebulun is near the Sea of Galilee. And we know that Jonah, uh, God's servant, the prophet, who was Gath, from Gath Heifer. So we now we know that Jonah was from the area of the Sea of Galilee. It's a... It, 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 it's not a, you would think somebody that has studied the word like these uh, Pharisees and scribes had done would uh, would have, have connected all those dots. But it's all right there in God's word to put all the connections together. And, and so what's the big deal? Why go through all of this? And so let's look at an account when Jesus is in his ministry. 
Uh, somebody read us a long passage there, John 7, starting at John 7, 40. Read that whole passage. Therefore, many from the crowd, <clears throat> when they heard this saying, said, Truly this is the prophet. Others said, This is the Christ. But some said, Will the Christ come out of Galilee? Has not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the seed of David and from the town of Bethlehem, where David was? <clears throat> so there was a division <clears throat> among the people because of him. Now some of them wanted to take him, but no one laid hands on him. Then the officers came to the chief priests and Pharisees, who said to them, Why have you not brought him? The officers answered, No man ever spoke like this man. Then the Pharisees answered them, Are you also deceived? <clears throat> have any of the rulers of the Pharisees believed in him? But this crowd that does not know the law is accursed. Nicodemus, who, he who has come to Jesus by night, being one of them, said to them, Does our law judge a man before he hears him and knows what he is doing? They answered and said to him, Are you also from Galilee? Search and look, for no prophet has arisen out of Galilee. See, they hung themselves right there. Now, I want you to look at what these Pharisees did. First of all, they make this claim. Back up there in verse 49. But this crowd that does not know the law is accursed. So they're saying, here's all these people. These average, ordinary, working folks. Uh, and they go to synagogue on Saturday. They go to their church gathering. And they're trying to live their life. And all they're doing is they're seeing Jesus doing the things that only Messiah can do. Messianic signs, healing the blind that are blind from birth, healing the dumb, heal, he, uh, doing all of these, healing leprosy. Nobody had ever been healed of leprosy except for Moses, you know, when he stuck his hand. That's the only time, the only God can heal leprosy himself. And so here all these common, ordinary day folks are watching Jesus doing all these miracles and they're putting their faith in him. But those Religious leaders, they say, this crowd does not know the law that is accursed. But who is it that doesn't know the law? They just got through saying, read, search, and look that no prophet is written out of Galilee. Well, we just determined right now, based on a basic search of Old Testament scripture, that they would have probably memorized that, yeah, a prophet has come out of Galilee. So God made a fool out of these people. And I cannot let us go by this passage without making a comment on this. Uh, it says it says right here, you know, these, these common folks, these common people that were following Jesus around, and they were putting their faith in him. They were believing he was Messiah. And listen to what these guys say. He says, have any of the rulers or the Pharisees believed in him? See, two things about that. The only people that could have anointed Jesus king of Israel was the priests, was the Sanhedrin, was the religious leaders. The people couldn't do it. That's why whenever you're reading through there in the Gospels and these people are trying to make him be king, Jesus, he'd slip away. He, he knew what the people would try to make him king. They did not have the authority to make him king. The rulers had to make him king. And they didn't. And that's why whenever you read in there, whenever Jesus is rebuking them, says, uh, uh, I'm going to misquote the scripture, but it says, uh, uh, you shut the gates uh, uh, to those that would enter the kingdom of heaven. Uh, see, that's the way they could do that. It was the literal physical kingdom that the rulers had. They could have given him and, and, and he could, they could allow all them common people to come into the kingdom. But they didn't slam the gate shut. They didn't make him king. But nowadays... Those people are called deplorables and people who go to war. Yeah, yeah that's, right. that's right. Common folks. Common folks. Uh, one other comment I didn't make, you know, so so Jonah, let's get back to Jonah here. Uh, Jonah is, he is prophet during the king of Jeroboam II. And so when you study your Old Testament, uh, you need to remember that whenever David uh, gave his kingdom to Solomon, uh, Solomon made a mess of things. 
it shows you that wisdom doesn't, doesn't always work out for a guy. Um, you got to put wisdom together with faith. And so uh, whenever, uh, so the, you had a united Israel, all of Israel was united under King David, and they were, it was all united under Solomon. And then Solomon's son comes along, Rehoboam, and he's a fool, and he's got foolish advisors. If you'll read the account, uh, he went to the, his father's advisors, and they told him what he needed to do to, to make the kingdom stronger and go on. And it says that he went and he got counsel from all the guys that he grew up with, the young guys. And so anyway, uh, God divided the kingdom. And so Israel became divided. You had the northern tribes, which in your Bible is usually called Israel. And you had your southern tribe, Judah, Benjamin, which is normally called Judah. And so don't get confused. That's why in 1 in, in and Second Kings, you'll have the kings of Israel and kings of Judah back and forth, back and forth. So anyway, Jonah's in northern, you know, he's from Galilee area, so he's in northern Israel, he's a prophet. He was a prophet alongside Hosea and Amos, and uh, there's one other one, I can't remember. Uh, anyway, they were his contemporaries. And see this Jeroboam guy, the, see the northern kingdom, uh, you know, the temple was in Jerusalem, which was in Judah. And so you, if you're gonna, if you're gonna uh, follow Mosaic Judaism, you got to worship at the temple. That's why you can't do it today because the temple's gone. Well, these northern tribes, they didn't want their people going down there to worshiping in Jerusalem because they were afraid that they would loyalty would go back to them. And so that's what Jeroboam. You hear, you'll see the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, what he did. Uh, for his people so that they wouldn't have to go down to Jerusalem to worship God at, at, at Jerusalem in the temple where the ark was. He made two golden calves. And he says, here is your gods. Here's the gods that brought you out of Egypt and did all of that. And so that's the sins that we're talking about. And so this is where Jonah is a prophet. He's a prophet for the northern tribes of Israel uh, during that time. And so... Jesus is going to use Jonah uh, in a lot of ways. Um, and he did that with, uh, with these Pharisees and made fools out of them. And I'll somebody read uh, Matthew 12, 38. And some of the scribes and Pharisees answered, saying, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. But he answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. And no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it, because they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and indeed a greater than Jonah is here. So here, here's some interesting stuff in this passage of Scripture. Again, this tells us why we need to really study, hone in on Jonah. It was such an important uh, uh, type of Christ situation in the Old Testament. First he says, that, uh, and here's the context of, of Matthew chapter 12. Now, they had just committed the unpardonable sin before this happened. They had accused Jesus of doing mis miracles by... Uh, the power of the devil. And, and that's the unpardonable sin, attributing the things of the Holy Spirit to the devil. And so they, uh, they are, they, after they did this, after the, he had been doing all these miracles, and they had been watching it throughout his whole ministry, and then they accuse him of being uh, demon-possessed. And so then they say they want another sign. They ain't going to get no more signs. He quit his signs right there for those folks. It, it, it was, it was, they, they committed the unpardonable sin, uh, which is a national sin. And, uh, and it says, an, an evil and adulterous generation seeks a sign. And so the only sign that he was going to have left, and these people, they didn't even, do you think they're going to figure that out? They didn't even realize that there was a prophet to come out of Galilee. Do you, do you think that they were going to figure out whenever Jesus was telling them, hey, just wait, and it'll all make sense after I get done, after he's 
crucified, he's buried, he rises again, it should have snapped. These people should have said, oh, that's what Jonah was about. But it didn't. And it's got a very interesting thing at the tail end of this. And I've thought about this a lot. And there's other places wherever the Bible mm -hmm. talks about in the judgment, nations being risen, rose up together and judged together. I don't know how that's going to work. I mean, we're all going to face a, an individual judgment. But look at what that says. It says, uh, the men of Nineveh, and we're going to find out what that's about as we get on in through Jonah, will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it. We see this in other places uh, where nations and armies are going to be rised up together and face judgment. But we'll, we'll comment on that again when we get a little bit further down in the book. All right, uh, somebody read verse Jonah uh, 1, 2, and 3. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. So, uh, why did God send Jonah to Nineveh? That's the question. Uh, let's talk about Nineveh for a minute. Uh, uh, Nineveh was a... Uh, well, let, we'll, we'll, I think we'll talk about that in the next verse. Anybody got an idea why did God send Jonah down there? To preach to them, right? Preach to them. Uh, and this was a test too. Listen, what he says here. He said that uh, Nineveh, that great city, and it says their wickedness has come up before me. So, so here, this city is wicked. We're going to find out how wicked this city is here in a minute. And God's idea is to go preach to them. Ask them to repent. Yeah. And what does that tell us about God? Somebody read the Psalm 86 5. For you, Lord, are good and ready to forgive and abundant in mercy to all those who call upon you. You talk about grace, man. Whenever we find out what these Assyrians are like, and we're going to find out how much grace God really has. Because what he, what he could have done. And in many people's eyes and in Jonah's eyes should have done is just wiped them out based on what they have done and what they are doing. Uh, God should have wiped them out, but he didn't. He sent them a preacher. Somebody read uh, Psalm 86, 15. But you, our Lord, are God of full, full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering and abundant of mercy and truth. So we see God has mercy even on the wicked. Yes, sir. You know, I, I, it, it's seeing this and seeing how it affects us today, when we, when we go through the book of Revelation, we constantly see God knowing that these people are going through great judgment and hell. He is very consistent to bring the gospel before them, just like he has America, just like he did the Jews before he... He dispersed them. He always gives a declaration of his grace and mercy. Mm -hmm. And if you choose to not repent, then his his judgment will follow. And and that's why can be. Yeah, that's why that even these vile I mean the prisons are full of vile, wicked, evil guys that have put their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ because God had mercy on them when they didn't deserve it. I know that you know I got saved after I was grown, and so it's it's uh, uh, you got to be careful that you don't uh, glory in however you were saved. Praise God if you were saved as a child, or or if you were saved later in life. But one thing that you do, what fun, that thing does happen to you when you're saved later in life, and you've lived wickedly, you really appreciate how much grace God has on the wicked, and uh, and and so. Uh, you're right, and in, in, even in whenever God's put, in the midst of him pouring out his wrath, you've got a chance, man. That's what the wrath is for. 
You know, you, you know, here's what makes more atheists than anything in the world is wickedness. People come around and they look and they see at all the wickedness in the world and they say, how could there be a God? How could there be an almighty, all-powerful, all-knowing God that's full of love, grace and truth and love and him be love and let all this happen? How could he let children be molested, women be raped and murdered and killed and all kinds of atrocities and everything, the Holocaust? How could, how, if God is real, how could he do that? Because God is long-suffering and merciful. He wants to give everybody as much of a chance as he can. And if he just wiped out mankind again, nobody gets a chance. Think about that. Would we have had a chance if he had just, he had just said, okay, I'm done back there in Noah. We're, 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 we're finished with this deal. No, there's evil in the world because God's merciful and given us a chance to come to him. All right, so he's full of compassion. That's why he sent them even to this wicked people. Let's talk about these people. Now, question four, why did God, why did Jonah hate the people of Nineveh? Let's, let's, let's look at Nineveh for a minute. Somebody read Genesis 10.8. Uh, Cush begot Nimrod, who began to be a mighty one on the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore it is said, like Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord, and the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, Eric, Akkad, and Kalman in the land of Shinar. From the land he went to Assyria and built Nineveh, the home of so Nineveh is an old city. Now we're studying this in, on Wednesday night uh, in Genesis. Uh, and Nimrod is, uh, uh, he is the descendant of Ham. We talked about Nimrod last week. Uh, he was more than likely a Nephilim uh, and uh, a, a giant. And, uh, and he, was, he instituted the rebellion. You know, God said, uh, spread out, you know, replenish the earth. And Nimrod and those guys said, nope, we're not going to do it. We want to, we want to come together and have a city. And, uh, and so uh, that was Babel, which ba later became Babylon. And we're going to see Babylon again in Revelation. Uh, uh, Babylon, Babylon began in rebellion, and it's going to end in rebellion. And, uh, but see, uh, he also built this city of Nineveh. Uh, and so, you, you, you know, when you're talking about the Babylonians or where you're talking about the Assyrians, you're talking about Babylon and Nineveh. And these were great, great cities in uh, metropolitan, uh, wealthy areas. Uh, let's see what Nahum uh, has to say about the city. Somebody read Nahum 3.1. Woe to the bloody city. It is, a, it is all full of lies and robbery. Its victims never, its victim never departs. The noise of a whip and the noise of rattling wheels, of galloping horses, of clattering chariots, horsemen charged with bright sword and glittering spear. There is a multitude of slain, a great number of bodies, countless corpses. They stumble over the corpses because of the multitude of harlotries, of the seductive harlot, the mistress of sorceries who sells nations through her harlotry and families through her sorceries. Behold, I am against you, says the Lord of hosts. I will lift your skirts over your face. I will show the nations your nakedness and the kingdoms your shame. I will cast abominable filth upon you, make you vile, and make you a spectacle. It shall come to pass that all whom look upon you will flee from you and say, Nineveh is laid waste. Who will bemoan her? Where shall I seek comforts for you? So Nineveh, Nineveh and the Assyrians are bad, bad people. Now when you do a search of Assyrian, Assyria and how their tactics were, I mean, the Bible even speaks more of uh, uh, Habakkuk talks about uh, the Assyrians and some other prophets, but when you just when you just go to ar archaeology and, and and history and you study the Assyrians and you see how brutal these people were, uh, they will skin you, skin you alive, take your skin off of you, and and uh, and and they would put these they would stretch their skins people's skins up, and they like to dismember people, cut their hands off. 
uh, and they would get rewarded on how the warriors get rewarded on how many hands they would bring back. Like to decapitate people, uh, rip the pregnant women open with a sword, take the babies out, dash the babies' heads against the rock. These are bad folks, uh, you know. And these folks, uh, uh, I mean, it doesn't get any more wicked than that. And they would, and they were, they, they had no mercy on these nations that they conquered. They would come in, and you either surrendered to them, or they wiped you out. And and so this is why Jonah hated these people, because this is what they were doing to Israel, and he knew they were coming. Uh, and uh, and so you think about it. Uh, Jonah knew. Jonah knew that, Jonah wanted these people wiped out. And wouldn't you, don't you think the Jews that come out of the Holocaust, that didn't they have a right to want the Nazis to be completely wiped out? Yeah, they did. They had a right to do that. Uh, and, but but Jonah, so Jonah didn't want to go preach to them. Jonah knew what he was doing. Jonah knew what God was doing. He was being merciful. To he was going to give them a chance. Jonah didn't want them folks to have a chance. He didn't want them to have a chance. Here's something interesting in this book of Jonah. Question five. Uh, when you run from God, and that's what Jonah was doing, right? He was running from God. God, God, uh, God told him to do something, and he ran from God. So what direction do you go whenever you run from God? West. <laughs> Look at the passage. <laughs> Look at the passage. What direction? Listen to this. He went down to Joppa, and he paid the fare and went down into it from the presence of the Lord. And you're going to find out that, that all throughout Jonah, he's going down, down, down. Down in the boat, down in the fish, down, down, down in the depths. And so, and so when you run from the Lord, you're going one direction, buddy. You're going down. You're going down. It's not a good place to be. All right, somebody read verse 4. The Lord sent out a great wind on the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship was about to be broken up. You know, today, uh, we, we suffer from, uh, you know, the enlightenment uh, that came along. That That's where men really began to... Uh, uh, put their faith and trust in logic and intelligence. And through that, and especially in the Western world, in our world, uh, the Greco-Roman world, they put a lot of stock uh, after the Enlightenment in, uh, in logic and science and all of these things. And that's why you had even Christian people uh, got wrapped up in all that and just began to discount the Bible, especially miracles. These people can't take miracles, man. And they want to. They want to. They want to have a natural, physical answer for everything that occurs. You're going to be a Bible believer and have a supernatural worldview, or you're not. And so, but we have the vast majority of Christians have a naturalistic worldview. They still claim to be Christians, and they may very well be, but they discount the Word of God because it doesn't follow their logical thinking. And God is not natural. He created nature. He's not natural. He's supernatural. And he can do anything he wants to with nature. And if you have a supernatural worldview, then you're not running around trying, wringing your hands, trying to prove God's true based on nature. You got a lot of people doing. That. You know, they'll try to they'll try to naturalize the parting of the Red Sea, uh, or they'll try to naturalize this or naturalize that. You can't do it. Just believe it or not. I don't care whether you believe it or not. Just but if you're going to believe the book, believe it. Believe it because it's true. And so God does intervene. Does, does God, uh, did, did he put natural processes in place, right? Doesn't the sun come up every morning, go down every night? And, 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 and the water, you know, vapor comes and rains and that whole system and all those things. He puts these natural processes in order, but he can step into his creation at any point in time and manip manipulate. Amen, sister. He does that in your life. I'm telling you, man. I guarantee everybody in here can look at a time when you should have died. And for whatever reason, 
whatever reason, God intervened. He wasn't ready. But you know what? That don't mean he always will. It, hey, there ain't no guarantee of that. You know, I've told this before. If you're dumb enough to go play golf in a, a, a thunderstorm, God just might take you out with a bolt of light. He might say, you know what? You're dumb enough to do that. But if he's got something that he wants to do, he might say, well, you know, you are a stupid idiot, but I need you for something. Else. I'd like for you to do something else. But there ain't no promise that, but God can and does intervene into his creation. Suspending natural processes. Let's look at some other instances of that. Somebody read Matthew 8, 26. But he said to them, Why are you so fearful, O you of little faith? Then he rose and rebuked the winds and the sea. And there was a great calm. So the men marveled, saying, Who can this be that even the winds and the sea obey him? See, it's one of the things that authenticates God. The only one that can manipulate nature is God and whoever God allows to do it. You know, he, he gives Satan some reign to manipulate nature too sometimes, but the authority to do it comes from God. Yeah, somebody read Exodus uh, 14, 21. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night and made the sea into dry land, and the waters were divided. So see, that's a supernatural occurrence that God uh, split that sea and held that water back. And I've often wondered, you know, I, you know, when I'm thinking about stuff like that, I wonder what what did the sea floor look like when them people was walking across it? I mean, did it still have like, you know, starfish and stuff crawling around, or was it dry? I don't know. I don't know, but it was it it happened, and it would have been really wild to have been there to do that. All right, somebody read James five seventeen. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. Wow. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. So here's a, here's a, a, God, a man giving a, a God giving a man the ability to uh, manipulate the weather, uh, and that is a pretty cool. Go back in the. In the Old Testament, and uh, and read that uh, whole account. It's a pretty pretty neat deal. Somebody read Nahum one three. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power, and will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord has a way in the whirlwind and in the storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. So God does use the weather, and He'll use it today. He'll use it today. He'll use it to bring judgment. He'll use it to bring. Uh, a, a message, and uh, but that's what it, that's what was going on. He 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 rose up this supernatural storm. And now these are veteran sailors. Okay, they know the difference. They know the difference in uh, just a bad storm at sea and something that uh, they had never seen before. Isn't it going on now, everywhere? Oh, I I I, I firmly believe uh, that God yeah. uses the weather today. Yeah. Uh, uh, absolutely. And some might say, well, don't innocent people, uh, aren't they harmed? It's not just the wicked. Absolutely. Don't, don't, don't think that we're not going to suffer for the wickedness that's around us. We're going to suffer uh, more and more as time goes on. All right, somebody read verse 5 and 6. <laughs> then the mariners were afraid, and every man cried out to his God and threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten the load. Jonah had gone down into the lowest parts of the ship and lay down and was fast asleep. So now this is a crazy thing. So here you've got these pagans that are on this ship. And it says they were afraid and every man cried out to his God. So you've got probably multiple nationalities of people on this ship. They're, they're worshiping different gods. These are religious guys. These are religious guys on this ship. And they know they're in trouble. And they're praying that uh, whatever God that they're uh, viewing that could uh, intervene in the situation, help us because we can't help ourselves. But here's what, what's ironic about, about that. About these guys are crying out to God, their gods, and Noah, I mean, and uh, Jonah is asleep. Hmm. Maybe not worried. He's not worried. Yeah, maybe not. <clears throat> Here's something ironic about it. The only guy on that ship 
whose God could do anything about it is asleep. And he ain't worried about talking to him. He ain't interested in talking to him. He don't want, he don't want God to know where he yeah. is. He don't want, he want to hear what God has to say. <laughs> and so here you've got all of these religious guys and they're crying out to their gods and they're, they're, they're devout enough to, to at least make an attempt. And the one guy, and, they, and they, they, the God ain't going to hear them. The one guy, the one guy could make a difference because his God is the one that would listen to him. He's down there asleep. That's pretty ironic. But like I said, these guys knew this was different. Uh, these guys knew this was a supernatural situation. And we'll find out more as we read on. Somebody read verse 7. And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots that we may know for it. Oh, wait a minute. Back up. I don't have read six. Yeah, read, read six and seven. So the captain... So the captain came to him and said to him, What do you mean, a sleeper? Arise, call on your God. Perhaps you, your God will cons consider us so that we may not perish. And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots that we may know for whose cause this trouble has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. So these guys see, and there's something strange about this fellow that's asleep down here. I mean, we're about to die. The 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 I can't ima you can't imagine how big the swells were on the ocean at that time. They threw everything overboard, all of their cargo, everything. I mean, you're talking about panic mode. And here this guy's asleep, and that captain, he's like, "What's going on? Call on your God." And then they see him cast lots. And here's something I I just kind of want to point this out to you. We see God using lots some in the Bible. And I'm not saying you need to go cast lots every time you need to do something, but I, I just want to say that God does use this and used it here. Somebody read Leviticus 16, 8. Then Aaron shall cast lots for the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for the scapegoat. So they didn't know which one of these goats that, that this, is, this is about... Uh, uh, the Israel's uh, uh, toning for their sin once a year. Uh, they, they, they let the Lord choose by casting lots. God's not going to talk to them. God's not going to say, hey, I want you to use this one. They use these lots to figure out which one. Somebody read Joshua 8, 6, 18, 6. You shall therefore survey the land in seven parts and bring the survey here to me that I may cast lots for you here before the Lord our God. Now, this is dividing the land. Again, they didn't know which uh, piece of ground when it, that God wanted what tribe to have or what, what family to have, and so they let God uh, pick it. And then uh, I'll read this one, Acts 1.26. Uh, and they cast their lots, and a lot fell to Matthias, and he was numbered with the 11 apostles. This is to replace Judas. The, uh, the disciples used lots. And so God used this situation to let these guys know, Jonah's your man. Uh, he called Jonah out right there. God called Jonah out to those guys, and uh, and uh, he's gonna he's gonna get him where he needs him to be. All right, now somebody read eight through ten. Then they said to him, "Please tell us, for those who cause is this trouble upon us, what is your occupation and where do you come from? What is your country and what people are you?" So he said to them, "I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land." Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, Why have you done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. All right, so uh, uh, here's the thing. You know, Jonah in his testimony about who he is, look what he says, I fear the Lord. But how does that claim not line up with his actions? Did he really fear him? He wasn't fearing him right then, was he? He wasn't even fearing him in the middle of that storm. He's asleep down the bottom of the boat. And so his, his claim at that point that he fears the Lord, and he does fear the Lord, but his actions were not lining up with, uh, uh, with what, he was act, what his actions were, his faith was saying. Uh, what made these men even more fearful when they heard what Jonah had to say? Because then they knew that he'd be after them too. They knew that God was the one behind this. They knew God. See, here's the thing. 
these guys were religious guys, okay? And so they didn't have a problem believing that a God was controlling the situation or had power in the situation. They just didn't know who God was. And so Jonah, he exposes God to these guys, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And what did he say? He said, the God uh, of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. Now, now, I'm going to tell you what. Whenever you're witnessing, it is important to tell people who God is. He is the creator. Because here's what happens, y'all. You got the Holy Spirit working on you from the outside in this day and time. They didn't back then. But, but, and you've got all of this creation that screams out, there's a God, there's a God, there's a God. And so there's a lot of people that, that they have that built in. God builds that into people to believe in a God. You have got to tamp that down to be an atheist. Because you're, everything within you cries out, there's a God. That's why you want to worship something. That's why these atheists worship stupid stuff like superheroes and all of that kind of stuff. Uh, it's, it's built. That's why science fiction is the biggest grossing entertainment. It is built into humans to want to worship something greater than themselves. So here these guys were, they were religious. And they and they knew that, that, that this was a supernatural event they were in the middle of. And God pointed out to them that Jonah was the it was the reason for all of this. So it authenticated who God who Jonah said God was. And so these guys immediately began to fear the Lord God of heaven. They're afraid. They're afraid of of, uh, of God. I guess we'll just, I thought we'd get better with, uh, see I told you I didn't know how far we would get. Uh, well we're out of time so we'll pick that up right there next week. Any questions on that? What does the casting of lots mean? Like when the lot fell on Jonah? Uh, drawing straws. Okay. Or put numbers in a hat. Okay. Or, or, yeah. Didn't they have the the stones in their pockets or something? Well, the priest, the priest used did. the Urim and the Thurim, which is another form of casting <laughs> lots. It's kind of like dice. And, uh, and so, yeah, it, it, it's giving multiple options on something and then letting chance or God yeah. figure out. But wasn't that uh, supernatural what they had on the priest that had the young um, Yes, because that was, was a light or something. That was prescribed by the law. And, and and you might ask why. Because God's not in the business of talking to people much. I'm not saying God don't ever talk to but it but he ain't in the business of talking to people much. He lets his word and, and in the Old Testament, he lets his prophets do the talk. So he talks to a prophet, prophet talks to the people. And so, but he didn't, you know, it was not a common occurrence for God to be speaking audibly to the priest to tell them what to do. And so that's why he used, you know, things like casting lots in the Urim and Thurm. I'm not understanding how Jonah thought he could run from the Lord. Oh. Well, I mean, really? It it speaks to his hatred of the Assyrians. He he knew how terrible these people were, and he knew what they had done to his people. And and hatred can do a lot to a man's brain. You can do hey, you can do a lot of crazy stuff. There's a there's a lot of people does a lot of crazy stuff for vengeance and revenge through hatred, and uh, and. Noah, I mean, uh, uh, Jonah, uh, he wasn't going to go and avenge this on the Assyrians. He wanted God to do it. And he knew if he knew if, if he didn't get in his mind, if I was to get in Jonah's mind, he knew that there was a chance if he went and preached the message that they would repent and they wouldn't get what he thought they had coming to him. And so his way of getting his revenge on the Assyrians, I'm just not going to preach the message. Wasn't that what the Lord wanted him to do because... He wanted them to repeat. Absolutely. Yeah, we're going to find out that next week.